You're listening to Curious Conversations About Sex, and my name is Rog. Stay with me as I invite sexuality specialists to join me in doing our best to answer your questions about sex. Topics range from simple through to the ridiculously complex. So long as it somehow relates to sex, it's up for grabs. Please be mindful that some topics might be great stuff for younger people to listen to, and some might not. Curious Conversations About Sex is brought to you by Curious Creatures, who run a variety of workshops on related topics in Australia. Find Curious Creatures and submit your questions for us to answer at curiouscreatures.biz. And today, I'm joined by Lorraine Pentelone. Hello, Lorraine. How do you just, would you like to describe yourself? Hi, Rog. Yeah, I'm a somatic sex educator. Great, wonderful, welcome. And Charlotte Sway, how would you like to describe yourself, Charlotte? Uh, I am a fetish escort and an experiential erotic educator, which is just another way of saying something similar to what Lorraine is. (laughs) (laughs) Fabulous. So, to today's question. I'm embarrassed about my protruding inner labia. How do I get around that? Hmm. Huh. Hmm. Hmm. That's a shame. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Several of us here in the studio are just touching our hearts. And can I also say, like that was our kind of like little bit empathic sad face, can I also a little bit go... <laughs> yes, you yeah. can. Yes. It's, I've, I've been there once upon a time. Uh-huh. Yeah. Hmm, that could have been your question? It could have been, yeah, 18 years ago could have been, definitely. Wow, thank you for saying. Mm. Wow. I've I've since learned to really love my labia and the rest of my vulva, but it took a while. (laughs) (laughs) Um, What happened? Um, How has your perspective changed? My perspective was changed by, by working in an environment where I was seeing a lot of labia and a lot of people were seeing my labia. Um, so this is your stripping world? Yeah, I worked as a, as a stripper for, and I still sort of dip my toe in and out of that world um, for 19 years. And, yep, I've seen a lot of labia and a lot of people have seen mine in that time. And I don't think I had one person ever say that they were too big or too long or too ugly. And I had the opposite. A lot of people really appreciating and, and, and saying how beautiful my labia was and I think, I think I was very, very privileged in that way to see what people's reactions were to them. Like, mm. When I first came into the industry, um, I think I'd been working as a stripper for maybe three or four weeks. One of the girls I worked with had that very same issue and went and had these really painful, expensive surgery done on them. Mm. I think they call it labiaplasty. Yes. Um, and she was out of work for some time and she was in a lot of pain and she thought it looked really lovely afterwards and I actually thought it looked nicer before I, and I really enjoyed the oh. way they looked before. And, so, and there we're talking just about the aesthetic function yeah. when actually it's, it's a pleasure function, it's a yeah. feeling function and so if you are going to get that snip, then you're sacrificing a whole lot of sensation. And Crime mm-hmm. against humanity. That is not yeah. on. I, I don't know. I, I don't want to be. I don't want to be down on people who do make that decision and have that particular uh, operation because I, I do understand what they're responding to, and I understand that it's all pros and cons and balances and so forth. So I don't yeah. want to flip mm-hmm. and be too shaming on True. people who have taken mm-hmm. that step. Yeah, at the same time, yeah, oh my God. Uh, look, Lorraine, your story's got so much in it around, like, um, uh, for one thing, wh- where does it come from in the first place, that what's meant to be normal? Because one of the things I love about your story is in looking at other vulvas, mm-hmm. you've gone, uh-huh, there's actually, well, I'm reading into what you're saying, but I'm imagining you're mm-hmm. going, there's a lot of diversity and there's a lot of, like, like normal is very... Broad. Broad. Yeah. 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 And subjective as yeah. well. I mean, what, what, what was normal in, in the stripping world was very different to what is normal in porn. Yeah. You yeah. see a lot of, a lot of very neat lovers yeah. in porn with, with hardly any, any labia. I think, um, 
Porn laws in the 70s. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not a 70s porn law illegal expert type dude. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, my understanding going back then, and please, like, I just need to give myself permission to get some of these details wrong, and I, I know that uh, everyone is really supportive and permissive of getting it wrong in sex because there's no such thing as getting it right. That disclaimer said and done. Uh, my understanding of 70s porn law was that in order to avoid triple X rating, which put a lot of restrictions on what could happen, there could be no, basically no pink bits, which was interpreted as meaning no inner, inner labia protruding. Oh, that and where it's it came the from. same law it says mm. no erect cocks. So there's like a really sex negative part to this. So a lot of softer porn that you saw and we were exposed to in the 70s and 80s that was readily available was based on that legal framework. Mm, which has built up the idea of yes. what is mm. a yes. beautiful yes. set of genitalia. And so a lot of people started going, well, a normal vagina, a normal vulva, you can't see lips. That's the abnormal, the inner lips. You can't see that. That's the abnormal thing. And um, it's a, a, hilarious. I don't know. Yeah. I've seen some statistics. Uh, <sighs> <laughs> this conversation's so yeah. exciting. I would yeah. zoom back a layer and just to say everything is beautiful and why are we even talking about aesthetics like that's something that has any value in the first place because it's all just culturally defined crap. However, if we are talking about aesthetics, as you say, Lorraine, some people actually like uh, protruding labia. Well, all the people that I've spoken right. to yeah, like as That's what I have. Yeah. And I was never really that, you know, exposed to... Then, or rather, my genitals weren't that exposed to diverse public opinion for quite <laughs> a long time. Um, but certainly, I have always had very positive uh, response to my genitals, and I have a very generous inner labia, which I love, yeah. um, because I feel like I have so much more of a palette for pleasure because of their size. Mm. Mm. Listeners wouldn't have been able to see the way Charlotte spread her hands in the most delightful <laughs> labia-like fashion as she said the word palette. <laughs> um, and, and they are a palette, and when you consider all the purples and pink hues that it becomes <laughs> flushed with. Yeah. <laughs> Nature's colours. Um, so what you're saying, it sounds like in your experiences... Uh, you've had at least as many positive responses and at least as many people who regard larger protruding labia as something they're attracted to. Definitely. Yeah. Like, yeah. I've, I, I, I don't believe I've encountered otherwise. Mm. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm. Yeah. And out, out of all the, I think probably thousands of, of labia I've, I've witnessed, this sort of aesthetically trimmed, sort of pleasing, um, Porn style labia, it, it's a small fraction of the labia that I've seen. And, and these are performing women who, some of them do have this operation to, to mm. trim it down, but majority of them do have large labia. It's, it is rare to have the trimmed mm. labia. Mm. I feel like I've seen some statistics that show that more protrude than do not. Yeah. I can't quote that. This is not real actual science or evidence, mm -hmm. but I feel like I've seen those statistics. Mm. I guess it certainly matches my lived experience, but... Mm. Yeah, it matches my lived experience in, in my personal and professional life. I... Oh, I just... You, you just can't stumble into this topic without just getting so fired up and angry about mm. the negativity and the judgment and the sense that our bodies and genitals need to look a particular way and that there is a standard and a norm. Like, God, I hate... I just, just hate that approach. Yeah. I, I so remember reading um, uh, The Beauty Myth when I was in my early 20s, which is just basically really hammering home the point, or at least this is the bit that I took home from it. It's just, just around how your body looks has got absolutely nothing to do with how useful it is to you mm -hmm. sexually and how useful it is to your partner sexually. Like that initial attractiveness uh that fits to a stereotype. Um, I feel like after the first, I don't know, three or six weeks or something like that, you have to step out of um, relying on stereotypical attractiveness and that whole fantasy that goes with that and replace it with actual presence and skills and touch and so forth. Substance. Mm -hmm. and, Substance. And, and enjoying the pleasure of your body and what it can bring to both you and your partner uh, as a whole as opposed to just that one little slice. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So, um, what specific particular strategies or tips or suggestions what, what might we have for this listener in terms of how... Make friends with your vulva. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and how might one go about something like that? Um, well, it could be it, it it could be quite a confronting exercise. But um, I was having a conversation with a a male friend of mine recently who was sharing how little most of his female partners knew about their own anatomy. Yeah, if he felt like. The, the males in his life knew more about female anatomy than the, than the, the females did. I, I think you could probably degender the conversation and say most Vice people versa. have no idea about their genitals. Most people have never squatted on mm. a mirror. Most yeah. people have never had a partner lovingly describe what they're seeing. And we're, because we're, we're more um, uh, experienced with other people's genitals than our own, yeah, make friends with it. Like, sit in front of the mirror and have a look at what what it's like, and yeah. you know, explore it with compassion. Um, it can be confronting, though. So you know, can be. Um, and I just want to acknowledge on the way through uh, some of what we're talking about there. The framework is that we might be assuming, if not heterosexuality, but that no, our but but are but even like even genitals. if you're with uh, like yes. genitals of the same type. You're familiar with other genitals, not necessarily your own. Yeah. Mm. Because it's not often yeah. that, like, yes, you might touch yourself, you might masturbate, but, you know, yeah. not many of us have actually sat there with a mirror and have a, had a good look around in a academic way with curiosity to see what it looks <sighs> like and what, what, and yeah. then explore what happens to it when it becomes aroused and how mm-hmm. does it change and what it looks like then and it's quite a different oh it's such um, good work like for mo- yeah for most people that's just such a foreign thing and i have to say i feel like i we're, we're we're talking about sexological body work a lot in this conversation in terms of training putting one through one's paces around making peace with one's genitals would well you that, that's or? certainly an exercise that i mm-hmm. did as part of my um study to become a certified sexological body worker and it was a profound experience Mm. Yeah, it, you can find it in other modalities as well. Um, mm. You can find it in the orgasmic meditation practices. Um, part of that is the they're very gendered in the way they do it, but I've been to um, some classes that do it degendered. Um, and yay, yay, <laughs> yay for degendering <laughs> stuff. But the, the partner usually, um, well, does in this practice, witnesses the, the other person's genitals and just describes them in a non um, in a descriptive way rather than interpretive, or interpretive, yeah. Yeah, subjective, yeah, yeah, subjective yeah without using sort of yeah. um, value judgment, value judgment, mm-hmm. using the word beautiful, things like that, taking all the judgment out and just describing the genitals, and that can be really empowering and, and a really new and fresh experience for people. And also, um, with the surrogacy training, um, one of the exercises there is to to stand in front of a mirror or sit in front of the mirror and describe your own genitals. Do this several times, just look and describe your genitals and then come together and do it in front of someone being witnessed, describing your own genitals. But definitely sexological body work, there's a lot of that mm. in the modality. Of Love it. And, and also with the um, introducing your genitals to yeah. somebody else, like how, what you like to call them, what they mm-hmm. What you like about them, what their positive features are, like how they have served you, yes. uh, how what you know about how they like to be touched or approached, mm-hmm. what you know about how they don't like to be touched and don't like to be approached. Mm. Yeah, training manual for genitals. Yeah, mm. yeah. And, and stories about the genitals as well. We, we we did a lovely exercise where we all got on the table in the training, and we we told a story about our genitals, so that bringing a time when you know you might have shaved and it went wrong and, and people saw what, what, whatever whatever stories come up for you about your genitals and that, that can lead to a lot of insight There's a, a, lot, a lot of things you can really realize even after years of doing the work and then trying that exercise again like I did recently and that could so that right. could be a really good way to begin understanding where the shame has come from mm. in relation to your genitals as well um, you, people may have had negative experience sexual experiences that have built up shame. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Mm. 
So staying with that question of uh, like what are some specific ideas or tips about how one might reclaim, um, anything further you want to add to that, Charlotte? I even like just to meditate on my genitals, which mm. is, is really just an exercise of cupping my vulva and feeling the warmth in it and just focusing my attention on that part of my body in a really loving way. I, yeah. is, it's a beautiful meditation for me. Mm. It's, it's calming, it's grounding, it's um, valuing, it's respecting. A, it's a countercultural part of the revolution. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's a really simple exercise to do. Wow, yeah. beautiful. Mm. Um, I, 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 I want to hear from you in a second, Lorraine, but, but before I leave you on this, Charlotte, um, do you, can you identify when, how long ago, you transitioned from having a neutral or negative relationship with your genitals? To... I didn't have a neutral or negative relationship right, so it's always with my been... genitals. Like okay. I, um, I guess, uh, oh, God, it's a big, big complicated story. Um, I was perhaps not fully embodied and I was definitely dissociated uh, for quite a long time and it's really been in the last three years, I guess, since really actively pursuing positive sex education, becoming a sex worker, um, embracing sex as the revolution, as a um, way to live a life really fully, um, that I have... My, my appreciation for my genitals has just exploded. So take home message there, folks. Uh, becoming a sex worker is not necessarily a re-traumatising, abusive process. It is actually <laughs> empowering and liberating. Lorraine, what are your thoughts on um, what particular specific activities uh, someone might do to make peace with their genitals? Um, well, mapping can be a good one. Ooh, what's mm. mapping? Describe mapping um, for us. Well, it's something you can do either by yourself or with a partner or with a sexological bodywork practitioner. Um, so when you're doing it by yourself, you'd be potentially using a mirror so you can see the areas that you're working around. Picking a spot, finding a spot, holding your finger on that spot, and just taking a few breaths and really noticing the sensations that are there, really, really paying attention to that one spot, honing your attention in trying a few movements, and then finding another spot, usually adjacent to that spot, and just working your way around and really reintroducing yourself to the different parts of, of your vulva or your genitals, depending mm. on your, your genital configuration. Um, if you're working with a partner, then the describing exercise that I spoke about before can be really helpful as, a, as an um, introduction to working in a mapping um, exercise. I imagine that serves the purpose of just when you when you well I'm um, um, bringing one's attention just so slowly and mindfully to mm. something which we normally just try and skim over or ignore or. I I, I do want to add though that it can also be 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 prepared for stuff to come up like yeah. it's not. It's not always a happy, joyful, I love my genitals experience. Like, mm. be, allow yourself the space and time for if emotions yeah. come up or stories come up or history comes up in relation to your genitals. Yeah. When doing these activities, mm. it, it, it is possible. We, we hold a lot of trauma and complexity in our genitals, and I guess the purpose of these processes is to help us process and free those things so that we're free to enjoy our genitals. Yes, yeah, so that's, a, that's yeah. a, still an absolute endorsement <laughs> and encouragement for the activities. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And I just need to add as well that these 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 um, activities need to be done separate to lovemaking. Yes. If they're a prelude to lovemaking, that can lead to um, the experiences that you were just speaking about, Charlotte Webb. I've experienced it myself while doing the training. I did a mapping exercise with a, a partner of mine and... I was feeling very juicy and, and sexy afterwards, and yeah, the lovemaking really took me to a place that I, I didn't want to go and wasn't ready to go. So mm -hmm. yeah, definitely, I can speak to that. Such a good point. Yeah. Um, Any other thoughts or ideas on specific things that someone might do to improve or develop their relationship with their genitals? I think being 
mindful as well about how they touch and wear and, and in what capacity they touch their own genitals. Because I noticed quite recently with myself, after going through my training and, and working in this field, that I still have a fair bit of anger towards my genitals. Um, and I'm sort of in the process of, of working through that and mm. figuring out where it is, but I, I did notice that you know, going to the bathroom, I'd, I'd be quite rough wiping myself. Mm. And that came as quite a surprise to me because I thought I'd, I love the way they look, I love enjoying them, I love my partners enjoying them, I'm, I'm very liberated and, and open with my sexuality and, and nudity and, and I'm very happy with my genitals, but just noticing that little bit of anger I had, have on wiping myself. Um, Mm, a bit thanks. of roughness there. Thanks. I think so, the self-touch is an interesting mm. part of this as well because we have very specific self-touch, self-pleasure habits in the way that we touch ourselves. And also another option is to expand yeah. one's repertoire in how one self-pleasures. So experiment with different types of touch in your genitals. Um, with And take take the their orgasm end goal out of the picture and just mm -hmm. be curious mm -hmm. about what other types of pleasure are available there. So again, it's like a practice and anything you practice you get better at. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Oh, mm -hmm. Love it. And uh, Lorraine, I was going to ask um, about, do you have any thoughts on, on, on when your relationship with your genitals changed from, say, being a little less positive to a little more positive, or but based on what you're saying, maybe that's still a work in progress? I think we're always a work in progress, Rog. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, my relationship with my genitals have, has, has been um, a big, a big journey. Yeah, I, I remember first being aware of my genitals when I was, I was quite young and noticing that they were changing, that my labia was growing, and, and, and that, that difference was what sparked the negative. And then going from that, I was probably about seven or eight, and then going from that, another ten years passed, and going to show my genitals to people for a living, and, and being a little bit uncomfortable there, and then finding finding the, the beauty in them, and really enjoying them, and, and not having um, these negative feelings towards how they look, and then, you know, Fast forward in another 10 years into going really learning how to enjoy them by myself and with a partner. And then, you know, fast forward in another five or six years and really learning how to be embodied. And it's still a work in progress. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. I think that That's catches good. it. Yeah, a lovely journey. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah my thoughts, uh, my thoughts on reclaiming are um, just very much around, uh, with me, it's always about communication and relationships and emotions and psychology. <laughs> That's always my obsession with this stuff. Um, have a real think about the people you're with and how much work they've done on themselves in terms of freeing themselves from particular ideas about how you're meant to look or how you're meant to behave or anything like that. And start to get really curious and interested in the ways that your partner or partners are not accepting you just exactly mm -hmm. as you are. And in terms of specific practices, um, it's a little random. I love what you've both said. Um, I my mind goes to genital worship uh, mm. and actually treating genital worship as a bit of an end goal. Mm -hmm. So saying, yeah, not only do I want to make peace there, I want to get to the stage where I have that much pride and that much understanding of the power and awesomeness of my genitals that I understand I can completely control and govern an adoring fan just with whether I allow them to see my genitals, whether I allow them to touch them, smell them, taste them, suck them, whatever. Uh, or just know that they're in the room. Mm. Uh, yeah, just to really continue and deepen that process, um, I think in the context of the sex neg negativity around us, one can go a long way down the worship path before one has gone too far. Can you go too far? I don't, I don't, so know. Far. I don't think so. you can. I'm going to go around and say, nah, <laughs> I can't, I don't see <laughs> Yeah. And um, I guess for me, so I don't identify as a labia owner, but I do own genitals. And just to answer that same question I've been asking from the both of you, and by the way, thank you so much for talking so personally about your bodies and genitals. Uh, thank you to all of us. Um, the thing I love about that is uh, just that we can talk about these things as if we were talking about mortgage rates or what colour to paint the picket fence or yeah. what band we're interested in going to see. These these topics and our the, the personal nature of them needs to be part of our day to day regular discourse yeah. so mm -hmm. as to normalise. So just thank you both for being so courageous. 
in doing Thank that. You. Mm. Um, yeah, for me, um, I don't know. I can the, the first time I looked at and held my genitals with what felt like clean, positive um, regard. Uh, um, when I say clean, I mean lacking in complexity and difficulty and nuance and shame and everything else. Um, that was only about eight months ago. It was a really specific, particular time. Um, I, the, yeah, nothing in particular changed except for hundreds of workshops and reading beforehand. But yeah, I guess as a cock owner, the pressure is a little bit the opposite to the labia problem. One's always too small, the other's always too big, or something really cliche like that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not free of that that dialogue. Um, but yeah, that whole that whole process of just um, going through enough processes of consciously regarding my own genitalia and having uh, enough partners um, approach the subject with sufficient positive regard. And also, does it bring you pleasure? Does it bring me pleasure? <laughs> and if it's not yeah, bringing you pleasure, work on that maybe a bit. Because mm. yes. it can be a great healing process. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Yes. So, coming back to the original question, I'm embarrassed about my protruding inner labia. How do I get around that? So I guess in summary, uh, one of our answers has been, yeah, look, if you need to um, have labiaplasty to have that sorted out, uh, we understand. And please also uh, look for an upcoming episode on how to recover and respond to, from surgery and scar tissue. Absolutely. Scar mm. remediation is vital in that regard, yeah. given how many nerve endings are in our genitals. Yes. If we then... Uh, embed that with lots of scar tissues, you're reducing your capacity for pleasure, so it's a serious trade-off. Mm -hmm. And otherwise we seem to be saying you're perfect as you are, and develop your relationship with your genitals more positively, mm -hmm. make sure that your partners are regarding your genitals more positively. Is there anything else I've missed there? I think embodiment as well. Embodiment? Yeah. Go on. When, once we go deeper in, and become more embodied, the problems that we're having, they tend to sort of become smaller and smaller. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's all, almost like um, uh, focusing on the tiny thing mm -hmm. and expanding one's experience of the whole self uh, yeah. as a vehicle for being in the world, mm -hmm. experiencing life, pleasure, intimacy, relationship. Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. love it. Um, I'm also thinking following on from the worship idea, like treat your genitals like they are an absolutely special sacred object mm. in your house and you cannot touch them with grubby fingers, you cannot touch them inappropriately, you have boundaries and limits around the times that you bring the great silverware out on special occasions <laughs> or something like that. I'm taking it too far. But mm. boundaries, um, mm -hmm. you, you wouldn't have a special sacred object just like bounced around and whatever. Yeah. No, they, these, these, your genitals are the source yeah. of life, people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the mountain. So if they have been regarded or touched inappropriately or in, incorrectly, stand for it. Put your boundary in place. Yeah. Use your no and your relationship with your genitals improves. <sighs> Alrighty. Um, so, Lorraine, Charlotte, thank you so much for joining me and responding to that question. Absolute pleasure. Yeah. And, <laughs> Thanks so much, and listen, all about. go and have fun with your labia. <laughs> so, uh, Charlotte, perhaps if you can say a little more about what you do and where people can find you. Sure. Um, so, as I've mentioned, I'm a fetish escort and experiential erotic educator. Uh, I've spent a lot of time, most of my career, as a sensory specialist making artwork, um, and now I direct that into collaborating with clients in uh, personalised erotic explorations um, in all sorts of realms of fantasy, fetish, BDSM, and girlfriend experiences. There's a broad range there. And I also really love educating people how to develop new pathways to pleasure and enrich their relationships. Mm, wonderful. And um, where can people find you? charlottesway.net Great. And Lorraine, would you be able to tell us a little more about what you like to do? I've just recently started a company called Sensual Touch Therapy. And what do you do there at Sensual Touch? Well, 
I've spent my first 19 years in the sex industry um, as a lap dancer, erotic dancer, stripper, pole dancer. Um, and when I started studying sexological body work, um, Charlotte and I studied that together, it was a wonderful mm-hmm. experience, I started to bring embodiment into my lap dances. And what I noticed was that really the, the, an amazing difference in the way that the clients reacted was a lot, it felt like a healing experience. So sensual touch therapies is a marriage of my erotic dancing, my sexological body work and my somatic sex education and somatic counselling all mixed together. Um, I'm a sexological body worker and um, I do bring some somatic counselling into that. It all sort of works with the same stuff. And yeah, Sounds that's great. what I do. <laughs> and you can find Lorraine at lorrainep.com.au. That's L O R R A I N E P dot com dot A U.